Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Um, and Jay had asked me to come and present a little bit on the Work on Watersheds report, which is a new publication. So I want to talk a little bit about the Hudson River Watershed Alliance first and make sure you all know who we are. Um, if everyone can mute themselves, that would be helpful. I'm hearing some background noise. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, who we are and what we do, watershed groups in general around the Hudson River watershed, the work on watersheds report and some of our needs assessment findings and what's next. Okay, so let's start with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance and who we are. So the Hudson River Watershed Alliance began in 2005 and was incorporated as a nonprofit in 2010. We work across the Hudson River watershed to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. Um, we're a small organization. I'm the only staff person, um, but we have a very active board um, of which, of course, Simon was the chair for many years. So here's a, a Zoom picture of our board and staff. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance supports watershed groups, works to improve intermunicipal coordination, like what you all are doing, and communicates as a collective voice across the region. We do a number of different education and capacity building programs throughout the year. We hold workshops on particular topics. We have monthly breakfast lectures, which are the second Thursday of every month, um, held as a Zoom webinar these days. We hold an annual watershed conference and regular roundtables for watershed group leaders and representatives to get together and share strategies and advice. So we've held a lot of programs that look like this picture, lots of people in a room together, learning, networking. Um, and of course, these days it looks a lot more like this, but we're still committed to bringing people together, learning from each other, developing this watershed community across the region um, and making sure people have the information that they need. So the Hudson River watershed itself is 13,400 square miles. It includes the Upper Hudson, which here is in yellow, the Mohawk River watershed here in blue, and the Hudson River estuary watershed here in purple. And this map shows all of the small streams that contribute to the larger Hudson River system. And we know that tributaries support the health and the ecosystem of the Hudson River through its watershed. And of course, each tributary has its own watershed. So we can look at the health of the whole system and start to piece out each of these individual watersheds. And that's where you all come in. So here's another map that shows the watershed groups, similar colors. We've got the yellow, the blue, and the purple. And if we zoom in here on the Moodna, of course, we have the Moodna Creek watershed and each of its sub watersheds. So this is where you all sort of fit into the larger picture of the Hudson River watershed and the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. So we work a lot with watershed groups. We consider that our core constituency. And when we talk about watershed groups, what, <laughs> what are we talking about? We're talking about community-based initiatives that are often volunteer run. Uh, as uh, Jay or Simon mentioned at the beginning, there are two intermunicipal councils, including the Moodna Creek Watershed Intermunicipal Council. Some watershed groups are led by agencies or nonprofits or have staff support. And what really sets these groups apart is their local knowledge of the watershed, the ways that they're advocating for its health in a holistic way, and collaboration is really key to this work. Watershed groups play a variety of roles. They do things like convening stakeholders, coordinating projects, educating residents, promoting stewardship, monitoring water quality, and in some cases, water quantity, like um, what's going on in the Moodna watershed, partnering on research projects, and creating watershed plans. So this probably isn't news to you all, um, but some people are not familiar with what we're talking about when we, we talk about watershed groups. And um, I think there's real diversity across the region in the issues that these groups are facing and the types of actions that these groups are undertaking. And that's where the work on watersheds report comes in. So this is a new report that was published in fall of 2020. It is a physical report. I saw Jay had his copy. Um, it's also available as a PDF on our website, and I'll put a link into the chat when I'm done sharing my screen. And this report compiles success stories from 32 different watershed groups that are working on Hudson River tributaries throughout the region. 
And again, these groups are working on diverse issues, and those include water quality, flooding, stream habitat, drinking water, source protection, climate resiliency, education, community engagement, and more. And we really tried to pull one story from each group that seemed really unique or particularly successful or a real accomplishment so that when we looked across the region, we could see all of the diverse ways that watershed groups are really making a difference. And it's at this point that I'll also thank our sponsors, um, Nui Pick and the Hudson River Estuary Program for funding this important document. So I wanted to show a couple of spreads so you get an idea of what this report looks like. Um, we've got different profiles, photos, some narrative, a key story that's in bold. Here's a couple more. And then the Moodna Council shows, of course, the kiosks. Um, this one's in Woodbury and the erosion issue that I believe this is Route 32 that we were talking about um, earlier in the meeting. I'll talk more about the moodness story in a minute, um, but just to back up quickly and say, we've also been working on a watershed needs assessment and the Hudson River Watershed Alliance interviewed watershed groups in 2019 and 2020 pre pandemic to learn more about their strengths and needs to guide this needs assessment, which will help us gear our programs to make sure they're really what groups are looking for. Through this process of need, the needs assessment interviews, we were able to identify specific themes. So some groups had real strengths in certain areas and real weaknesses in other areas and in other groups, those things were reversed. So we're able to learn what makes groups successful and that also helped feed into the work on watersheds report. So in terms of the needs assessment, we're recognizing that there's this really important relationship between local and regional work. We know that implementation happens at the local level. New York state is a home rule state, which it brings challenges and opportunities. And by understanding the strengths that watershed groups bring, we can build meaningful partnerships based on shared goals, thinking about opportunities at regional levels, at statewide levels, and so on. And so again, the goal of sharing these success stories is to show some of the opportunities, both for our watershed group partners, for larger organizations that might want to partner with watershed groups, and so on. So I'm going to highlight a couple of stories from the work on watersheds report using the needs assessment themes on some of the things that we've found help create successful groups. So those include structure, partnerships with technical experts, and collaborating on implementing projects. Okay, so a couple of examples of structure. It, groups are often very successful when they can plug right into statewide or regional initiatives. So they don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. And a great example of this is the Trees for Trips program, which is already described in this meeting. This is sort of, I'm trying to pull a lot of pieces together with this uh, presentation, is a program that provides free native trees and shrubs to plant along streams. The application period is currently open. Apply by March 1st if you have any sites that uh, could use some buffer restoration. Um, so this is the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance. And over the course of um, almost a decade now, the Alliance has planted over 600 trees and shrubs along the Coxingkill, a tributary to the Rondout Creek. They've done maintenance there. They've planted lots of trees um, and it's really made a big difference. We have a before, during and after photo series in the report. Another example of a guidance document is the Department of State Watershed Planning Guidance. The Upper Hudson River Watershed Coalition recently completed a watershed management plan that identifies 190 different priority projects to achieve the watershed goals. So they were able to use Department of State funding and use this guidance document to come up with a plan that's really geared towards implementation. So the, those 190 different priority projects across this whole watershed lines them up really effectively for funding of those projects. In terms of drinking water, the Sawkill watershed community used the source water scorecard that was developed by Riverkeeper. Other opportunities include the drinking water source protection program through the New York State Department of Health. Uh, but the Sawkill watershed community is working closely with the town of Red Hook on watershed protection policies that came through this scorecard process. 
In our needs assessment interviews of uh, 32 watershed group members and leaders, we asked, do you feel like you or your group is lacking technical skills? And we expected everyone to say yes. <laughs> and 32% said no. Uh, so that was about a third. And we were really surprised by that. And when they said no, they said it emphatically. And they said no, because we have partners that provide access to a variety of technical skills. So that's when people talked about collaborating with colleges and universities, bringing on experts, working with municipalities that have expertise, right? So again, these partnerships are what allow groups access to all these technical skills. That's not to say that groups didn't need technical skills. Lots of groups had questions about water quality monitoring or legal questions or all kinds of other things. But again, I think this really speaks to the importance of partnerships. So an example, from our report is the Spark Hill Creek Watershed Alliance. Since 2008, the Spark Hill Creek Watershed Alliance has been sampling for Enterococcus in the Spark Hill Creek, which is a small watershed in Rockland County. They've built on that partnership with Riverkeeper to work with researchers from academic institutions in their region. They created the Lower Hudson Partnership with other small watersheds in the Lower Hudson to share information and best practices and methods. They worked with the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Estuary Program, the US EPA, and recently worked on um, the, the PEERS project, a new water quality monitoring protocol with DEC and again with Riverkeeper. So building on all of these different layers to provide the volunteer group with the technical expertise that they need to better understand their stream. The Wallkill River Watershed Alliance has been working on harmful algal blooms. This photo is from 2016, when a massive harmful algal bloom in the Wallkill River proper impacted over 30 miles of river for over 30 days. The Wallkill River Watershed Alliance had funding in place to actually be documenting water quality during this time. So they were able to take samples of nutrients and they happened to have three uh, PhD academic scientists who are experts in nutrients and al algae, algae uh, as part of their alliance. And so they were able to work with those scientists and with the DEC to confirm that the levels of toxins were extremely high during this harmful algal bloom. So the alliance was able to take those samples, get them to the uh, labs and the people that needed them, and then got information out back to the communities on the public health risk that this harmful algal bloom posed, uh, which was significant over the course of, of that month period. The Wallkill River Watershed Alliance didn't turn their back on the Wallkill. They wanted to make sure people still saw it as a resource, not as a just as a potential threat to public health. Um, and so Martha Chio and others started the Great Wallkill River Race to bring people down to the waterfront and experience what it's like from the water. The Alliance also worked with Orange County with funding from the Hudson River Valley Greenway to establish the Wallkill River Water Trail. And they have a website that shows access points, current river conditions and information so that people can paddle on the Wallkill. One of the things we found in our needs assessment interviews was that uh, volunteer groups play a really important role in watershed planning to line up projects, education on opportunities and building support, but they aren't necessarily the ones that are implementing water quality improvement projects or water quantity, you know, flood mitigation projects. When it comes to implementation at the local level, it's really municipalities and soil and water conservation districts that are active in implementing projects. Volunteer groups may not have the budgets, they might not have the capacity to manage big grants, um, but certainly municipalities, soil and water conservation districts have real infrastructure needs in particular, which is what we heard. So uh, we have a few examples of collaborating on implementation, and this is where the Moodna Creek Watershed Intermunicipal Council comes in. I think your work over the past several years on flood resilience is really impressive and something that other groups should know about. Um, this photo is of the village of Washingtonville during Hurricane Irene. And as you know, the Moodna Council has worked on two different flood mitigation plans in the upper and lower portions of the watershed and implemented a series of stream gauge 
to monitor real-time flood conditions that linked to Orange County's emergency management system to alert residents and get them out of harm's way. So this is really, I think, really important that there's the planning, there's infrastructure in the ground, there's these collaborations at the county scale um, to really help people and, and reduce the risk of flooding. Oh, that's 15 minutes. Okay. I have a couple more slides. Another example is culvert assessments. Our example in the work on watersheds report comes from the Sawkill Creek watershed in Ulster County, where the Ulster County Department of the Environment did a watershed scale assessment of every place that a road crosses a stream within the Sawkill watershed. And implementation of the priorities will be done by the municipalities in terms of right sizing or replacing culverts that might pose a risk for flooding or an impact for fish passage. And lastly, um, we've got the Monhagen Brook in Middletown. And the Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District received funds from the Water Quality Improvement Program in 2016 to do a series of green infrastructure projects at a retail plaza in the city of Middletown. They worked on a watershed management plan for the Monhagen Brook and now are working closely with the city of Middletown to implement a series of retrofits that are right in the downtown area within the Monhagen Brook watershed. And I think what's significant about this example is that although the city of Middletown applied for funds funds from WQIP to implement green infrastructure projects. Um, when they didn't get those funds, they're very competitive. The city recognized the value of the, these types of practices to improve stormwater management and found the, the budget and found the money to do those retrofits on their own. So what's next? So I encourage you to read and share the work on watersheds report. I'll put a link uh, in the chat to that PDF document and also to stay in touch with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. So please sign up for our monthly email newsletter. As I mentioned, I'll be doing an article on the Community Protection Act and Fund uh, or Community Preservation Act and Fund in our next digest. We have articles, we have grant opportunities, information on programs. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Hudson River Watershed Alliance. We have a YouTube channel where we post uh, information and programs that, that we've recorded. And I'll just mention uh, that we actually have a program tonight at 6 p.m. on research on microplastics that has been done in a couple of different uh, lakes and tributaries um, in the Hudson Valley. So if you're interested in learning about microplastics, we have a program tonight um, and there'll be more, more to come as well. So that's it from me. And I'll drop some of those links into the chat for you. And I'm happy to take any questions as, as time allows. Yeah, I, I, anybody who wants to ask questions, I'll just let you field them and moderate yourself. My, Emily, as much time as you want to take. I know it's, it's 1130, so anybody? Thank you for your work. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'll add that um, we're giving uh, giving this presentation as a series of briefings to regional organizations and state agency staff as well, so that they also understand um, the important work that watershed groups are doing. So just know that you know I think this is an opportunity for you to hear about maybe your peers or what other groups are doing, um, but I think. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance is also going on the road with this information to advocate for you all to show that you all really are making a big difference in your communities and on clean water. So, I just want to say, Emily, before while you're still on, I, I, I just realized I'm watching this and listening to you. I'm biased here because I was the chair and helped start the Watershed Alliance, and I'm I'm watching what you're doing, thinking like like I feel like I'm watching my my kid that went off to college here. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I'm so glad the Alliance is doing so well under your leadership and the current board. And, um, and I do want to say to our council, for those of you who, Emily said it, but it's worth repeating. We are one of only two formal intermunicipal councils operating, watershed councils operating in this whole region. As far as I know, the whole Hudson River estuary region and um that's a big deal so i'm glad everybody is on today and 
seeing the great participation and having the partnership with you, Emily, and the, the alliance to, to get the word out and work with other groups and tell them what we're doing, vice versa, is, is fantastic. Yeah, we're, we're here for you. We're here to provide Zoom, you know. <laughs> we're, we're here to provide technical assistance. The article on the CPF came about from a question somebody had, and I was digging into it, and I thought, oh, this is something that everyone should know, right? So if you have particular questions, Emily. don't hesitate. Thank you. Somebody, there's a lot of background noise somewhere, but. So mute yourself, and it answers, but... Just a quick question, Emily. Uh, so much depends on open space preservation. Have you worked with uh, various land trusts around to get uh, some idea of what uh, the the uh, that type of organization, the the cooperation between that type of group and your groups, has that come into play at all? Just a question. Yeah, so we, great question. Um, yes, land protection is so important. That's one of those local level, you know, action items. Um, we work with several land trusts and I, many land trust staff come to our programs, come to our meetings. Um, and so that's a connection that I'm hoping to keep building out um, and, and helping land trust connect with watershed groups as well. I think there's real potential there. Anyone else? I have to go. Okay. Sorry. Um, is that okay. Tracy? Tracy, shoot me an email if you have another question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Emily. You'll, you'll all still be here, I think, but <laughs> thanks very much. I have to run to another meeting. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. So we, thanks. Yeah, the Zoom connection should stay on. Uh, even though Emily's disconnecting.